Well, I lied. I thought the next video was actually going to be about um, assessment findings, but first we're going to talk about NIH. So the NIH, or it's a National Institute for Health Stroke Scale, it's not like just NIH, but we call it NIH for short, um, but it's something that the National Institute for Health came up with that is a specific um, scale to measure deficits um, in a patient that has had a stroke. Um, so um, this is something that like every year I have to get revalidated on. I have to watch all these videos and score people um, just to prove that I understand this assessment. Um, but it's really important because um, those little subtle changes and the brain is really hard. There's so many parts of stroke that it's really important to have a good comprehensive assessment. Um, so some basic stuff to know about NIH stroke scale is one here to, to alleviate your fear. Um, GCS, you absolutely will have test questions where you'll have to um, score, figure out, like know in depth or be able to like look at um, that. We could not give you a question. Um, we would have to like make a full video and like it would be lengthy for you to scale or uh, to score someone on this scale for NIH. Like it's impossible. But what you do. So I'm going to go through the scale so you kind of know what's in it, but I'm not going to go crazy in depth um, because it's something you're going to have to learn because like I could go over it 15 times and it's just, it's a lot. Like it's not something that anyone, maybe someone who does it every day has memorized, but most nurses do not have this memorized. Like literally we have a handout and anytime I have to do it, I have to look at it just to make sure I cover all my bases. Um, but the NIH, what happens is someone comes in, it's suspected stroke, um, the ER nurse is usually the first one, or even they might do it, um, you know, in the, um, they, we usually, uh, my understanding is we usually start with, the, they do like a mini NIH on the way to the hospital, then in the hospital, we do a full NIH. Um, and then like, let's say, for example, like the way that I interact with this assessment is if a patient's going straight from the ER to go to like get the clot removed from their brain in, um, interventional, in interventional radiology, we'll talk about that. If they're going to go there, I'll actually meet the ER nurse um, in the procedural area. Um, and I will do an assessment on the patient before they put them under that way. I have seen their baseline because so many things are so different and can change. So this is what my hospital does. I'm not saying every hospital does this, but um, some hospitals like I will actually go down and assess that patient before they go and have any intervention done that way that I can say, hey, here's how they were before and here's how they are now, since I'm going to be the one assuming care of them after that procedure. Um, so the NIH is a longer assessment and it just allows for me to <clears throat> get a more comprehensive look at how they're doing. Again, it measures deficits. Um, so the only thing that we would test you over with this is not necessarily like what's on this, but you do need to understand what is a sign that an NIH is good or what's a sign that it's bad. So the normal NIH is, um, uh, what do you call it? A normal NIH can range anywhere from a score of zero to 42. The higher the score, the worse the patient is doing. So the higher the score, it's really counting how many deficits the patient has. So we want a low NIH. Um, remember for GCS, the, like, cause these are both acronyms and you guys can get them mixed up. GCS is level of consciousness. We want a high level of consciousness. We want a low NIH. Um, and so um, with the NIH, again, the lower it is, the less problems the patient's having, the better they're scoring. Um, so we want it to be lower. So we could give you a question and um, say something about whether the NIH is going up or down. Is that a positive sign or a negative sign? Um, so that's all that you'll need to know. Or like, you know, for some, um, like if we were talking about treatment after a stroke, how would I know a patient's doing better? If their NIH was improving and improving, I mean, going down, um, then um, it would be a good sign that the treatment is working. Um, so GCS, we want up high level of consciousness. NIH, we want low, we want it down. Um, the lower the score, the less the deficits. So let's talk through this. Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say there's like 13 questions as a part of it, um, but effectively um, what is happening um, with the NIH stroke scale is they're evaluating all the different like cognitive and other functions um, to see how the patient's doing. So one of the first questions we ask is we do, um, we check orientation and level of consciousness. So we see, are they awake? Um, we also asked, see if they can follow commands, could they answer two questions? Um, so, um, and, and there's like, there, like if you fill this out, like there's like a scoring system. It says like, are they awake? Like if, um, if they are like they're, 
awake and alert, you know, like, you know, very easy, don't have to arouse them, you're going to be this number. So you would see this, I'm not going to go deep into that, but just know like there's a scoring system just like there is for most of these scales. So are they awake? Um, can they answer two questions? We, uh, yeah, sorry, awake. And then um, for orientation, we um, usually ask them like, what's your name? What's your date of birth? What year is it? Stuff like that. Um, then we want them to do two basic commands. So this is the same as when I talked about commands where we want them to be like, hey, give me a thumbs up. Um, or um, uh, we got raise your eyebrows, stick out your tongue, something like that. Um, then what we're, there's going to be some tests that look at visual gaze, and that's where they kind of like have you follow the finger across and see um, if you have any eye movement difficulties like this lady is here in this um, top picture, um, because you can have um, decreased motor movement in your eyes after a stroke. They also look for any visual loss. That's where they, the guy at the bottom is covering his one eye, and then they literally sit here and go like this, and they see if they can, um, they'll be like, what side, what side am I, um, like, you know, what's like, you'll do like this and they'll be like what side am I doing this and they'll be over here and you have to be able to like say which side it is so anyway and I can't do it very well to myself but um you get the, you get the point there is videos too if you want to watch and learn about this but again I promise we won't test you in depth but I want you to look at this because I want you to think about all the problems a patient can a stroke can have and there's also facial palsy so that's where we have them smile and we have them smile and then raise their eyebrows too because they can have a droop in their eyebrows they can also have a droop here um, it's called the nasolabial fold fancy words um, but we look for any sort of um, decrease or deficit but you can see her uh, in this picture how she has a um, a droop on one side um, then the motor the arm that's where we stick the arms out and then see if one drifts we have them hold their arms up for 10 seconds and then see if there's a drift um, and then um, we usually have them do both arms at the same time. <clears throat> no, never mind. No, usually I'm thinking about it. Yeah, just one arm at a time. Can you hold it up for 10 seconds? For the legs, we have them hold up for five seconds, um, one at a time. Definitely don't ask them to hold both their legs at a time. Maybe with arm drift, we do have them at the same time. I can't remember now. I'm having a, I'm having a moment, maybe um, having a neurological uh, deficit myself. Let me do limb ataxia, and I'm not going to try to show you this one. We effectively take your heel and um, ru uh, rub it up and down on your shin. And this is just to see ataxia kind of, I always remember ataxia is like you need ataxia um, to get around. It's kind of like um, you, it's like a abnormal gait or um, what do you call it, where you, your balance is off. So it's really just seeing if you can um, run your heel up and down your shin um, with coordination. So kind of think of it looking at coordination. Then sensory, this is where they, they use a variety of types of pressure. They might use soft pressure or harder pressure. And they're pretty much seeing side to side, like they might touch and say like, does one feel um, sharper than the other one? Or does one, do you feel one side more than the other? And they start at your face and make, make their way down to your, um, your arms, your legs, and see if you can feel better or differently on one side than the other. <clears throat> then they start getting into some of the cognition and other stuff. So they'll do things like check your language. So this is literally the thing that you will have and everyone has the same one. Um, and they will check your language. They'll ask you to read these sentences. They'll say, you know how down to earth. I got home from work um, near the table in the dining room. So they'll have you read. They'll also have you look at the this picture and have you describe it. Like they'll say what's happening in this picture and they'll see if you can talk about it and how fluent your speech is around it. Um, they'll also have you look at this um, these objects and see if you can identify them. There's something called agnosia that can happen um, after a stroke where you can look at an object but not be able to say it. Like you could be holding your phone and not know the word for phone. So they're seeing if you can identify these objects. Um, and then this is um, this one with the um, words on the right hand side is what we call um, the dysarthria test. And a dysarthria test is looking for um, abnormalities in articulation. So there's speech, like my ability to sit here and just communicate, but there's also articulation where you can hear all the words that I am saying. So like, if you think these were, um, these words require more enunciation. So with dysarthria, someone's going to, it's going to be really hard to understand the words they say. When someone has dysarthria, it's actually because of the stroke, like it, it, um, it weakens their jaw or uh, the muscles in their mouth or in their throat. And so it leads them, it's harder for them to talk. They can't really articulate well, and it's hard to understand them. Um, <clears throat> so for this one, it's like mama, tip top, 50-50 and someone who has um, dysarthria, I'm not, I'm not going to do this well, but it's like, uh, 
Hit, huh? And he, huh? Like you can't really understand them. It's like gonna be like they can't really, um, they don't have the muscle strength to really articulate those words. Um, then extinction or inattention, um, that's where they're going to like usually have you close your eyes and they're going to tap on one leg or the other and see if you are giving attention to both or you can feel both of them. Because sometimes people have one-sided neglect or they cannot feel on one side. Um, so I found this like online video um, and it's okay. They they do it with a normal person. So it's a little hard to say, but if you wanted to see more about um, what it looks like, definitely you can watch it all the way through. All right. Oh, I have a scenario before we end. Since you are administering TPA, which I know you guys, we haven't talked about TPA yet, but let's act like you know what it is. So we're administering a treatment for stroke to a client with an ischemic stroke. Their NIH goes from 17 to 35. What is the back, best action to take? What is the concern with this change? So we have to think about, okay, what's the issue here? I'm giving a treatment to make a stroke better. And their NIH started at a 17 and now it's at a 35. So you have to think first, is it getting better or worse? Okay, well, it is getting worse. So remember, we want our NIH to go down, not up, especially with treatment. Um, so we haven't talked about this yet, um, but TPA is a, uh, what do you call it? Um, it is a medication given for uh, ischemic stroke for people that have a clot and it's a clot buster. So if I'm giving a clot buster to a patient, I would expect their clot to bust and they would start to improve in their neurological status. If they're getting worse, we're worried they're experiencing a complication. And so if I'm giving a medicine that can bust all clots and really break down um, blood cells in my um, bloodstream, what am I worried about? I'm worried about bleeding. So if the what can happen with TPA is they can start out having an ischemic stroke or a blood clot stroke, but after administration of TPA, sometimes a complications, they can end up with a hemorrhagic stroke or bleeding in their brain. So anytime, this is just like a little pre-hint for future videos, if you haven't already watched them, that if I'm giving TPA and the patient's uh, mental status is getting worse, a lot of times that's a sign now that they're bleeding in their brain. So usually I'm going to stop um, and call the doctor and let them know about this change um, because they could be having a new stroke. We'll probably get a stat CT. All right, the next video will actually be about left versus right um, stroke symptoms.